Hey guys. Hey Jim. How you doing? Frank, keeping busy? There you go. Hey guys. Yes, How I am. <clears throat> well, there's at least three of us on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Jim, how you doing? Great, thanks. Hey, you doing good? All right. Nice day out. It is here. <laughs> I wouldn't know. I've been stuck in the office with no windows here all day. <laughs> Get a different <laughs> office. You're the boss. I should. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Are you ready? I'd like to call to order the Ottawa County Board of Commissioners. The date is Tuesday, March 23rd. Our invocation today is by Commissioner Terpstra, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Rachel Sanchez. Please rise. Are you ready? I'd like to call to order the Ottawa County Board of Commissioners. The date is Tuesday, March 23rd. Okay, so we have some playback, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Dear Lord Heaven, thank you for allowing us to meet today. Lord, just thank you for um, the warmer weather and as we enter spring and um, that we enter the planting and growing season for the farmers that we just pray that they have great uh, harvest this fall. We just also pray for the safety of our residents, also for the uniform men and women home and abroad and just pray for wisdom during this uh, meeting for us commissioners and that uh, we make uh, good decisions. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Hey, Rachel, would you call the roll, please? Yes, Mr. Kyers. Here. Floor. Yes, here. Mr. Holt Floor? Yes, here. Yeah. You can't hear me? I see his mouth. Uh, it's, it's not on mute. Now I hear you. Thank you. You're Mr. Welcome. Garcia? I'm here as well. Mr. Dannenberg? Here. Mr. DeYoung? Here. Mr. Zylstra? Here. Mr. Terpstra? Here. Mr. Mepelink? Here. Holland, Michigan. Mr. Bauman? Here. Mr. Fenske? Here. Mr. Bergman? Here. Mr. Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you. You're welcome. Next thing is presentation of petitions and communications. Um, public health update. Lisa? Um, is here today to present the data portion of the presentation. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, vaccine and Doc's going to update you on the variant. So let's start with Darrell, if that's all right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Darrell, I might ask you to remove your mask and be sure to speak clearly into the microphone. <clears throat> otherwise, they won't hear you on Zoom. Very good. Good afternoon, commissioners. It's good to be here today. Um, I'm happy to be here in person to share an update on COVID-19 here in Ottawa County. Um, I've got a presentation to share. It's on the screen in front of you, um, and I'm just going to navigate through that starting now. Can you advance the slide for me, Steve? All right, thank you. I'll just do it verbally. Okay, so um, as you've probably heard in the press and the media, there has definitely been an increase in cases across the nation, the world, and also here in Ottawa County. And so this is just a snapshot of the number of cases every day since the pandemic began here in Ottawa County back on March 
15 here in 2020. We've basically come full circle. We're mid-March again, and we're seeing an upswing in cases. Over the last three weeks or so, we've gone from about 33 cases a day, moving up to an average of 71 cases per day as of yesterday. So we're definitely seeing an increase in the number of cases. Next slide, Steve. We're also seeing an increase in the number in the rates. And this is just a snapshot going back through September. So instead of the cases per day, it gives us the cases per day and normalized it by population. It's a good way to compare to other places. And you can see that we've been in a long-term downtrend since mid-November with short spikes after Thanksgiving and Christmas. And then we've it's hard to see kind of there in the bottom right, but we've also had an average case increase uh, just over the last few weeks as well. So just more indication suggesting uh, that we're in an uptrend. And I do want to point out on the screen too that there are you know, big events that are part of our lives are that like Thanksgiving and Christmas, holidays like that. And even though spring break isn't a holiday for many people, it's treated as such. So there's travel and vacationing. So just um, be aware that they may have an impact on case counts and rates in the weeks ahead. Next slide. Also, I just want to point out that our positivity has increased. So the number or proportion of tests that are coming back positive uh, was at a low in mid to late February at about 2.9% and has increased, you can see the arrows there, from a low of 2.9 to a, a current rate of 8.4%. Um, and these numbers are important because some of the institutions in our community, like courts and schools and other institutions, just rely on um, those numbers being below certain thresholds. So 10% is a key mark, as are the other lines on there, like 15 and 20, given an indication of our risk, but also uh, our activities for different institutions like courts and long-term care. Next slide, please. This is just a snapshot of the cases, the hospitalizations, and the deaths in Ottawa County. I know that those numbers are a little bit small, but I just wanted to point out again that instead of by day, these are by week. So the top bars in blue just show that we're swinging up. So we were at a low a couple of weeks ago in the 200s, then the 300s, and now the 400s. And we're about at about 100, and we're only a couple of days into the week now. So I expect these numbers uh, to stay elevated for a period of time. Hospitalizations are starting to tick up a little bit, but if there is a really good news, a silver lining for the slide, just notice in the bottom, the maroon bar, the last two weeks, we have not had any deaths reported among Ottawa County residents due to COVID-19. So there's a lot of hope sprinkled through some of this uh, poor news. Next slide, please. When we look at our hospitals, they're also doing um, fairly well. They have plenty of capacity to meet the needs of our community. This is just a snapshot of the beds that are occupied on the top graph and on the bottom graph, the proportion of beds that are occupied by COVID-19 patients. You can see that the hospitalization increase that we saw on the previous slide is also reflected in the, the tiny uptick at the bottom. So we've usually been running around 5% of uh, hospital beds occupied by COVID-19 patients. And as of yesterday, it was 9%. Next slide, please. Look at our ICUs, more of the same, uh, just a little bit of a blip in the bottom uh, graph on the far right. You can see that the proportion of beds occupied by COVID-19 patients has gone up a little bit as well. And so we, we are seeing an increase in cases, a slight increase in hospitalizations, and that's just depicted in all this different data. Next slide. <clears throat> Uh, changing gears a little bit, instead of talking about surveillance for COVID-19, I also want to talk a little bit about vaccine progress in the community. This is just a reminder of the vaccine phases that we're in, uh, and, and you can kind of follow down the different groups that are eligible on the left side and then follow uh, the green bars to indicate which groups are eligible and when. And you can see that there are many, many different groups uh, that are eligible to receive vaccine across the state of Michigan right now. And here in Ottawa County, we're working to make sure that we uh, provide opportunities for vaccination for as many of those groups as we can. Next slide. So you can find on our dashboard um, the progress that we've made in Ottawa County for uh, overall for all um, eventually eligible uh, residents. Uh, this is, you can find on our dashboard. You can also find it on the state's website. This is just a little bit different way to display it. You know, pretend like these are um, speeding dials uh, like you have on your car. There's a, a little ticker that will indicate where we're at. So our goal is to move that, that needle all the way up to the green, which is 70% for this population. We've uh, vaccinated here in Ottawa County about 17 and a half percent of our eligible population, which is uh, a point about a point, point and a half above where the state of Michigan is. So uh, we're doing well compared to our peers and compared to the state overall here in Ottawa County. Next slide, please.
What I'm really proud of is how well we're doing for the 65 plus population. We've talked many times before about how this population is, um, is more vulnerable uh, for hospitalization and the poorest outcome of, of death. And here in Ottawa County, we're definitely above the state uh, to the tune of seven or eight points higher uh, than the state in getting that population vaccinated. So about 45% of Ottawa County's population, 65 plus, is completely vaccinated uh, against COVID-19. Uh, what's not depicted here is that 70% of Ottawa County residents 65 and up have had at least one vaccine in their arms, which still confers a lot of protective power. And so just keep this kind of statistic in your head because there's a couple slides coming up that I want to show you what impact that's having. Next slide, please. We've also had conversations about equity, just making sure that we're getting to the, the populations, our black and brown community, and those that have less access to healthcare and vaccine. And here in Ottawa County, the latest statistic indicates that for the vaccine clinics that Ottawa County is providing uh, vaccine for, uh, we have exceeded the proportion of um, non-white and Hispanic persons in the county uh, by vaccinating about 8%. 8.8% of the people we vaccinated are uh, non-white or Hispanic, and that's higher than we'd expect to see uh, in, in the county. So it suggests we're approaching equity for this population, and this is the population that's at highest risk. Next slide. So a couple of things, there have been questions about vaccine allocation here in Ottawa County, conversations about using social vulnerability uh, indicators as an as index, as a way to allocate vaccine. And just wanna say that, you know, we've, we've heard these questions and we wanna share a little bit more about that. Here in Ottawa County, we've, re we've received about 65,000 vaccines. And when we look at the data and compare it to the state and other counties, uh, the rough estimate here in Ottawa County is we're probably about 20% under allocated. And this is, has various assumptions, um, but I also wanna point out that that statistic may seem big, but when we think about it uh, and look at it across all of the counties, we're probably middle of the pack as far as vaccine allocation goes. There are counties that have received more and there are counties that have received less. And here in Ottawa County, we continue to be a little bit higher than the state of Michigan with vaccine completion, uh, despite being a little bit under allocated. And I just wanna let everyone know that vaccination is a community effort. So even though we may be slightly under allocated in Ottawa County, there are communities around us like Kent County that um, have a little bit more vaccine and people in Ottawa County can be vaccinated in Kent County. And so I just wanna point out that this is a regional statewide and national effort. Um, and there is availability outside of Ottawa County to receive vaccine for Ottawa County residents. Next slide, please. Okay, this slide is kind of the, the um, where I, what I've been driving through with a number of the slides so far. Uh, this is uh, COVID incidence rates. So the, the rates of COVID for different age groups and the age groups are depicted by the lines and the legend that's kind of in the middle, zero to 29, 30 to 49, 50 to 69 and 70 plus. And this graph goes back to the beginning of February to as of a day or two ago. And I wanna point out, especially the red line. The red line is our population who is 70 years of age and older. And you can see that as the case rates started to go up when we switched over from February to March, the case rates for that highly vaccinated population stayed relatively low. So this strongly suggests that vaccination is working for our highly vaccinated portions of the population. And when you look at those other um, lines going up, those there's gonna be different levels of vaccination in those groups, um, but generally for most of them, only less than 30% will be completely vaccinated uh, or have initiated vaccination. So this is just really good news uh, that the vaccine is working, that people are being protected, and it's just demonstrated in something that we can measure here locally. Next slide. So to some, we're seeing community spread. Case rates and lab positivity have increased. Our hospitals are still in good shape, but we're seeing an uptick. Um, the good news that we've seen is that we haven't had any deaths reported in the last two weeks. Um, people age 65 plus vaccination rates are relatively high, 45% completely vaccinated. And what's not shown here is 70% have at least one vaccine in their arms. So everyone among everyone eligible, 16 plus, I know that not everyone is eligible right now, but eventually they will be. About 17 and a half percent have been completely vaccinated. We started our clinics back in December and since then here in Ottawa County, uh, the vaccines that we've given to people, uh, we've achieved what we hope is uh, approaching equity for our less served uh, populations. And lastly, just a reminder again, the vaccine works and among our highly vaccinated populations, we're definitely seeing uh, lower COVID rates, you know, strongly suggesting that the vaccine is protecting people. So that's it for me, thanks. Okay, 
Nice job with those stats. We're making progress, and so we're very pleased about that. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about vaccinations. Um, first, just to remind everybody our vaccine goals um, protect our healthcare system's ability to provide adequate, adequate care, reduce COVID 19 hospitalizations and deaths, decrease extra burden of COVID 19 on communities experiencing social vulnerabilities, and preserve infrastructure essential to our community. So, all the decisions that we're making about how and where to do vaccinations line up under these objectives. And as Darrell uh, pointed out, we are making significant progress. Um, one kind of broad statistic is 30% of our 16 um, year olds and older have initiated vaccine. That's a really good statistic. That means they've at least had one shot. 70% um, of our 65 and olders have at least one shot. Um, keep in mind, 70% is our goal. We'd like to see 70% of the entire population of Ottawa County vaccinated by the end of 2021. And that is what we're working toward. Um, our vaccine allocations um, continue to increase slightly. Um, we'd like to see them increasing more, but uh, we'll take whatever we can get. Um, so we've, we've averaged a four week average of 2,880 doses. Um, we continue to work closely with our hospital and pharmacy and other community partners to ensure broad distribution throughout the county using what we call a push pull model. This means that we have a network of partners that are um, capable and qualified to receive vaccine and administer that vaccine in their environment. At the same time, we are pulling people to us, to our mass vaccination clinics um, throughout the county, uh, specifically at the GVSU Meyer campus and Civic Center. We continue to uh, vaccine, or excuse me, we continue to distribute vaccine to cover a variety of geographic areas throughout the county. Um, we, we have a goal of uh, not having anybody need to travel more than 20 miles to reach a vaccine, and I think we've done a great job of that. We, over the past two weeks, um, last week and this week, we've had clinics in Grand Haven, Holland, Hudsonville, Zeeland, Jenison, and West Olive, and vaccines are being, being provided in a number of community settings, including Holland Hospital Urgent Care. We've had several clinics at uh, food processing plants, schools. Um, we're providing vaccine to Spectrum Zealand Hospital and North Ottawa Community Hospital. Uh, we've provided a clinic at a church. Spartan Nash, uh, through their pharmacy program, will be holding a clinic at uh, a grocery store that had closed down in the Hudsonville area. And it's a big, broad, wide space that we can put a lot of people through. And so that one's coming up this week. We <clears throat> have, um, I, we've also done our mass vax clinics. And did I mention a farm? We've provided vaccine. So um, that is a part of our outreach uh, to uh, do outreach with the ag community and um, they're really great partners. Um, appointments have been open to all people in phase 1A, which remember um, Darrell put up the green um, shaded areas, which include frontline first responders, teachers, childcare, food and ag workers, 50 plus with medical conditions, and of course the 65 and older age category. We've also provided uh, special clinics for 65 and older food processing workers, seasonal ag, our developmentally disabled residents, caregivers of children with special needs, and members of our black and brown communities. Um, these are the communities that we're targeting because they have a higher um, amount of social vulnerability and have challenges with accessing vaccine locations due to a number of um, social challenges. Um, these outreach efforts can only be done with the strong support of our partners in each of these communities. And I just always have to thank them. They have been calling and scheduling people and every week um, fill appointments for us that we've reserved for these special populations. And I can't thank them enough. As we look forward, we continue to plan for vaccine allocation to grow. We're looking at a phased approach. So right now um, we <clears throat> have been doing about 2,500 uh, doses at, uh, at a time at the Civic Center site. We believe that we can probably put 4,000 people through that clinic in a day. Um, if we could provide vaccine there on multiple days, you can do the math and kind of figure out we can, we can do a lot of people. Um, we're looking at plans that would 
align with getting 6,000 doses a week and then 10,000 doses a week and then more than 10,000 doses a week. Um, our, our, it, we're continuing this push-pull model and in using that, we've had weekly meetings with our hospital and pharmacy partners and they are ready. Um, we've practiced, we've done small clinics in each of these settings and um, the more vaccine we give them, um, the more they will put in people's arms. So as a community, I feel very confident in our ability to uh, broadly dispense vaccine to all of our residents. <clears throat> I should also mention that um, there are the vaccine that we get as a county comes from the state to the local health department. Um, it used to be split like 60, 40, 60 would come to us and 40 would go to the hospitals. Now it's about a 90, 10 split, which means we get 90% of the vaccine and that's how we can push it out to our community partners. We are seeing some changes at the federal level where uh, the feds are essentially doing a direct push of vaccine to some of our pharmacies. Um, perhaps some of you have seen Meyer, and that's an example where they're getting a federal allocation. And um, I know that both of Myers and Holland are doing vaccine clinics. And the point of me bringing this up is that it's good news. So when I talk about the vaccine that we're allocated, that's not all the vaccine we're getting. Some of it is coming as a direct federal allocation to other partners. Another partner that's gonna receive or is receiving a federal allocation is Intercare Community Health Network. Um, they're a partner that will be working alongside us to vaccinate in our ag community. Um, we're especially looking at um, when our seasonal agriculture workers get here, we know they they travel a lot. They're all around the United States. They've probably had exposures. So we're working on setting up both testing and vaccination clinics um, with our local growers. Um, one thing too that I wanna mention, um, the state continues to lighten gathering restrictions. Um, we've seen positive impacts on our businesses, especially in hospitality, hospitality and food service. Um, Jarrell mentioned, we always have to say, because it's just so important, we, um, we aren't out of the woods yet and it's important for us to continue masking and distancing and hand washing and all of those protective measures that we know really work. Last Friday, the CDC communicated a change for schools related to six foot social distancing requirements. Um, this created a little bit of a stir. We got a lot of calls on this. Uh, the change made by the CDC was essentially already in place in Michigan. Um, it's nearly impossible for uh, young people in a school setting to maintain a six foot distance. And so from the start, the state said, yes, you really need to work hard to maintain a six foot distance, but you know, three feet is acceptable, especially when you've got a bunch of kids in a classroom and you can't possibly distance the desks um, six feet consistently. So for us, this isn't a really big change. Um, the confusion comes in when you talk about the definition of um, the distance to identify who needs to get put into quarantine. And so this is a little bit of a, I don't know, still a confusing point. We have reached out to our partners at the state for clarification on this. And they have told us that um, exposure is still defined as coming within six feet of a person who, for more than 15 minutes um, who has a positive um, case of COVID-19. So those are the rules that we will continue to follow. I believe that this is a fluid situation. There is new research coming out um, daily and the CDC and MDHHS are always reviewing this new guidance or new research and um, attempting to align the restrictions based on that guidance. So we'll keep a close eye on that and keep all of you posted as well as our community members if anything changes. Um, <clears throat> changes related to COVID from the state and federal government come every day as you all know. Um, in many cases, they come without our prior knowledge or we find out 10 minutes before you do. Uh, but it's not unusual for me to get a text message from my husband with an MLive article announcing um, something that I am just hearing about. Um, the minute those announcements are made, our phones begin to blow up at the health department and, and I'll just be honest with you, a lot of times we're somewhat unprepared with answers because we're finding out in a news release at the same time that everybody else is. I think this is important for people to know. Um, we realize that some of these restrictions are very difficult for people. Um, 
and we know that some people don't agree with them. We also know that everybody in our community and across the state and country want to get back to living the life that they had before COVID. So do we at the health department. As public health officials, our responsibility during a pandemic is to follow and enforce MDHHS and CDC rules and laws that have been identified to protect our citizens against the spread of COVID-19. We are not the researchers doing the scientific studies to determine what protective measures are effective and must be followed. We therefore can't change the rules or laws as it would be irresponsible to take risk with people's lives without necessary evidence that any change would do no harm to our citizens. I do want to remind our residents that the employees of the health department are people that are trying to serve their community, do their job well, and protect our residents. They have been working tireless, tirelessly, very long hours for over a year to help educate and support our community throughout the pandemic. Our team members are not making the COVID rules, yet often bear the brunt of people's frustration. If people are frustrated, we want you to know that we understand. We really do. Um, we get frustrated too. Um, we're all going to get through this, and we understand that it's hard. But if we stick together, we will get through it. But please remember, these are real people that work at the health department on the receiving end. Please communicate in a way that is consistent with Ottawa County's long held values of kindness and respect. We welcome feedback at the health department. We want to know how to improve. We have and will consistently listen. We will always try to improve our processes, respond to our community's needs and respect the diverse opinions of our community members without judgment. We do care. We will get through this. We do, however, want to emphasize that we do have limitations to what we are authorized to do. Lastly, um, I want to emphasize my support for the continuation of the county emergency declaration. As Darrell and I have communicated, we are making great progress. However, <clears throat> we have a way to go. The emergency declaration in some cases is a misunderstood tool. It does not give power to restrict people during the pandemic. Those powers and duties come from the Michigan Public Health Code. The emergency declaration allows county government to be flexible, ensure timely response, secure financial resources to our communities and allocate them to meet the greatest needs in a timely manner. With things changing at the state and federal level so quickly, we really need to continue to be nimble and flexible. I have so appreciated the board and the county administrator and administration who under these emergency declarations have consistently ensured responsive, transparent and balanced government throughout the pandemic and feel confident that that would continue under an extension of the current order. So um, Doc was gonna talk a little bit about variants. Doc, do you wanna just take questions or do you wanna come up and speak to that? Okay, great, thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. This will be very short, um, just because we talked about this uh, at the last meeting, and plus Lisa didn't tell me I was going to do this, so it's going to be a little shorter today. <laughs> anyway, just to remind you that there are three variant strains that we're following, uh, and all of these strains, the reason we're concerned about them is because they are more contagious and may in some cases be more lethal. The main one that we're seeing is the B117. This is the, the UK or United Kingdom strain. This is about 50 to 70% more contagious than the normal strain that we're seeing here. And it may also be more lethal. The, uh, there was a study done a couple months ago in the UK and they found that this was about 40% more lethal, but that hasn't been uh, proven in other, uh, in other studies yet. Um, fortunately, it looks like right now that all the vaccines are effective against this particular strain. So far, there have been about 6,400 cases here in the United States and every single state in the union has had cases. Uh, we have had uh, 616 cases here in Michigan. Most of these uh, are in the prison system uh, with inmates and employees there. We've had four uh, confirmed cases of this strain here in Ottawa County. In fact, we had two this week. And we also have five samples at the state, at least five samples at the state Bureau of Labs right now uh, being 
uh, evaluated to see if the, this, the, if the, these samples may also be from B117. So that's the first one, that's the main one. This is the one that the uh, CDC thinks will probably be our predominant strain here within the next month or so. The second one is called the South African strain or the B1351 strain. This also is more contagious. This is uh, considered to be potentially more serious than the other strains right now, uh, because there is concern whether or not the vaccine is going to be effective or whether or not uh, the virus can bypass some of the antibodies that you get either from the, the uh, disease itself or from the vaccines. It's not as prominent. Uh, it's, we've had 194 cases in the United States. We have had one case here in Michigan, uh, but we have had no cases here in Ottawa County. And then finally, the last strain is the P1 or the Brazilian strain. Uh, there isn't much information on this. There have only been 54 cases in the United States so far uh, and no cases in Michigan. Since I talked to the last time, uh, there's been more information now about two California strains. Uh, they're given the name B1427 and B1429. Uh, these are about 20% more contagious than the other strains uh, that are out there. Uh, and also there's the concern that the treatments may not work as well. Uh, fortunately, again, the vaccines they think uh, will probably work, but again, these are some new strains here. These are sort of homegrown strains and uh, a lot of research is being done on those. Hopefully we'll have more to tell you the next time. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to ask everyone to stand and applaud the health department for the job that they've done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, are there any questions of uh, any of them? Yes, Mr. Fenske. Um, this is probably for Durrell or, or Lisa, but uh, um, with the cases that uh, have been vaccinated to 16 plus and over, uh, it came out to be about 17.5%. So if I got my vaccination, which I did in Kent County, and the federal government is going to be pushing out some at Myers. Um, are you tracking those to make sure that that's part of that figure at all, or is that kind of hard to do? No, that's a really good question. And it kind of comes down to are, are, if you're vaccinated outside of Ottawa County, are you counted in the numbers that 17 and a half percent? Um, and the, where we get the data is at the state level and they track where you get vaccinated. So you could get vaccinated as an Ottawa County resident up in Grand Traverse and it would still be counted toward Ottawa County's numbers. Excellent, thank you. That's a good question because uh, many of my friends are getting um, them from Mercy Hospital System, which is in Muskegon County, of course. So anyone else? Anyone on Zoom? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do have a quick question and it might be better for, uh, you know, I don't know if it get better answered by Al or by, uh, yeah, by corporate counsel. What would be the consequences if the uh, county health department or the county itself chose not to uh, abide by the restrictions that are being imposed by the state or the federal government? Yeah. <laughs> um, we have seen uh, the state enforce these rules within um, the city of Holland. I know that prosecution that's occurring there is happening by the attorney general's office. Doug, excuse me, lift the microphone up a little bit. All right. You? Right. Set for Lisa. Okay, yeah, that's good. Thank you. Yes, um, a couple things could happen. One, we could be disciplined. Um, theoretically, the state could pull the uh, authority uh, from the county to operate its own health department. Short of that, uh, and or immediately, the state can move in and has uh, moved in to enforce uh, some of these restrictions uh, within Ottawa County. Um, and I mentioned uh, the prosecution that's occurring of a restaurant owner. Um, the Semlo chiropractic case has been taken over by the state of Michigan. So 
uh, it could move into Ottawa County and enforce uh, these uh, regulations. They have co-jurisdiction with the health department. I don't know, Commissioner, if that answered your question. Yes. Thanks, Doug. Anyone else? Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, Lisa, thank you for your for your report today and, and giving us some encouragement. I know it's been a long road for all of us. And and for me personally, I just I like to hear some encouraging words once in a while. And and thank you for sharing that. And then I know because we're we're live on YouTube, I want to share list my experience a little bit with a shot so that people out there or people you run into know what's going on. I had I had my first shot today, uh, extremely professional. I mean, you, you walk in, they take really good care of you. I was in and out in less than five minutes. So please share that with the people out there that they're, they're just doing for myself today, that just a tremendous job of, uh, of getting you in, getting you out, getting you in the shot. So anybody that's out there listening or neighbors or friends, or whatever, tell them not to be concerned about the shot. Tell them to get signed up and, and get the shot because it's very, very easy. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, did you... Joe? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Lisa, the uptick in cases, um, what age group is that primarily? Uh, another good question. Um, Steve, do you have that presentation up still that you could pull up and share? So the age groups that we're seeing are generally anyone that's younger than 70. It's the last one with the red line just above all the words. So one prior. Yep, this one right here. Uh, this, these are the age groups that we're seeing the increase in. And uh, it might be hard to tell there, but the group that <laughs> has the highest incidence right now that's most affected is the age group that's 30 to 49. And there's not many of those folks that have been eligible for the vaccine and vaccination rates are pretty low uh, on any age group, honestly, less than 60. And I'm excited about the 50 plus being eligible for vaccination because there's still some measurable risk for uh, excess hospitalization and even a little bit of excess death in that, that crowd. Uh, but right now what we're seeing is that mostly it's the younger crowd that's um, contributing most of the cases. And there's not a lot of burden borne by the age group 70 and up, which is the red line there. So mostly younger folks. Okay, thank you. I had a question, Darrell. Um, if, if, if you had uh, tested positive for COVID ready, would it be better for somebody else to get the vaccine that has not before you or not? Good question. And I think that I think that maybe Dr. Heidel could help me with a little, that a little bit as far as the medical side and um, which immunity is probably uh, better for a person. Well, it is true that if you've had COVID, you do have form antibodies. The problem is we don't know how long those antibodies last. So um, I, I suppose it would, if it came down to you had one dose and you had two people and you had to give it to one or the other, more than likely uh, you would give it to the person who had not had COVID. But again, we're not facing that situation. So again, we know that even though you've had COVID, you need the two shots uh, because we don't know how much protection that you have with that first one. Plus, we don't know how long that protection will last just uh, as it, with the uh, vaccine. We don't know how long that protection is going to last either. So you think this will be a yearly vaccine like the flu or don't you know? Mm, they don't know, but that's one of the big questions uh, that the CDC is uh, dealing with right now. The FDA is how long does, uh, if you're, if you have COVID, how long does your protection last? If you've had uh, the uh, antibody or the vaccine, how long does your protection last there? We don't know. And this is a big question right now. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, I guess we're ready to move on. Next thing on the agenda is public comment. Um, anyone in the audience is welcome to come to the podium and, and they have three minutes. State your name and your address. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm Ron Vanderveen. I'm an attorney with Cunningham Dahlman from 321 Sutler's Road in Holland. I have a couple things to comment on and I want to, uh, I've got a letter to pass out that summarizes those comments as well. So I'll pass it to the clerk here. I represent Kyle Terpstra. 
And, and he asked me to take a look at rule 3.6 that's proposed. And uh, I know it's on your consent agenda for today. Um, and I, I have really three problems with, with that rule. Uh, and I'd like to express those to you. First off is, is paragraph three of the rule. Uh, paragraph three of the proposed rule requires that each of you, if you think there's any impropriety in any actions by the county, uh, that you take that to corporate counsel first. Uh, and the purpose of that, I'm told, is to make it privileged information so it can't be discussed in public. Um, and uh, that is just a, a rule that violates the First Amendment rights and the Open Meetings Act uh, provisions that would allow the commissioners as well as members of the public, just like members of the public, to be able to express concerns about county issues uh, in a public meeting. Now, I'm not talking about privileged matters. I'll mention that in a minute. But, but for non-privileged matters, non-confidential matters, um, it is certainly uh, within the, the authority of any of you commissioners to be able to express that during a public meeting. Secondly, the privilege issue. Uh, paragraph two uh, rightfully says that privilege information should be kept confidential. The difficulty I have with that is that it doesn't really define privilege matters so that each of you would be second guessed after the fact if the commissioner, uh, chairperson of the commission uh, were to think that you violated a privilege. Now that could be remedied easy enough by indicating what privilege really means. And that would be information discussed in closed session or information exempt from, the, from FOIA. Now you might tell me though, there are a lot of other statutes that exempt information from public disclosure, but all that is bootstrapped into FOIA. So a rep reference to FOIA would, would take care of that. Um, last thing uh, we see as a problem would be the enforcement investigation provisions uh, in the rule, uh, starting at paragraph four. Um, calls for a private meeting with the chairperson and uh, the county administrator and corporate counsel. Uh, a meeting that is not public, obviously, because it's private. We would believe that that's a violation of the Open Meetings Act that requires meetings to be open to the public. In fact, there's a provision in the Open Meetings Act that a person, a public official or employee who is going to be subject to potential discipline or to um, evaluation uh, can request a closed session, but it's up to that person's uh, choice to make that request and not the county board's rules. And um, so we would submit that that's not valid. Is that my three minutes? It is. How about that? All right, well, anyway, those are my three points. Thank you very much for listening. We would ask that you change those, the rule. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, we do have two comments on Zoom as well. Okay, all right. Ask them. Okay. Your name and address. So when I hold on to yeah. so the first is Wendy. Okay. Can you please state your name, uh, your name and address? And you have three minutes. I don't think we can hear me. Wendy? Yes. You're oh. up. Could you, you please state your name and address and you have three minutes? My name is Wendy Molker and it's 5198 in Hudsonville, Bower Road. I am concerned because um, my children have to be tested supposedly come beginning of April for to play in sports. What makes me frustrated and why I don't understand is because I work for a major health care facility here in this area and I don't have to be tested at all to go to work. Um, the only time that I would ever have to be tested is in order if I have signs and symptoms. Um, and if anyone in my household tests positive, I still, and I do not have signs and symptoms, I still have to go to work. I work for a major healthcare system. I work, now I think that's a little bit strange that I don't have to get tested but my child has to be tested if they have no signs or symptoms to play a sport. That is um, very frustrating. And also my children, the whole, I guess we've been told that three feet, um, it's been reduced down to three feet as far as um, social distancing is concerned. If my child is at school and is wearing a mask at all times, 
once again, that person next to them, if they test positive, my child has to be quarantined. Once again, I work in the healthcare system. If my coworker tests positive working next to me, as long as I'm not exhibiting signs and symptoms, I have to still go to work. So I am just very concerned and frustrated why my child has to endure having to be tested to play a sport. And I work for a healthcare system and I do not. And that is all. Thank you so much for your comments. Thanks, Wendy. Anyone else? Uh, yep, we have three additional comments on Zoom. Okay. Okay, I have, uh, Becky, I have you unmuted. You have, uh, please state your name, address, and you have three minutes. Hey, this, this is Becky Mulder. My address is 1587 Rebecca Run in Hudsonville. Um, I'm also concerned with the contact tracing. Um, we don't need to be quarantining the healthy kids. Um, in our small, well, medium-sized private school in Hudsonville, we have had zero positive cases that can be traced back to a close contact at school. Um, I've requested data from the health department um, showing why or how they can support to continue quarantining these kids. Um, I'm also concerned with the masks in sports. I've been to 54 basketball games in this shortened season. And at about every game, one of the players will lose this mask, it falls on the floor. You know what they do. They pick it up or the ref picks it up or the coach picks it up and they put it back on their face. You cannot tell me that we are concerned about their health and safety when they are putting on a disgusting, filthy mask back on their face. I'm requesting that you as the board of commissioners, please request from the Ottawa County Health Department, the data that supports the continued contact tracing and the wearing of masks. And I'd also like to reply to um, Lisa, she says that they have to follow what the state is telling them. According to the new order, the most recent order, paragraph 10 says the local health departments are authorized to do this. They are not required to do this. So there is some leeway and we can make local decisions. Okay, thank you so much for your comments. Uh, next up, is uh, Jenny, please state your name, your address, and you have three minutes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jenny Gamby, 5140 Water Leafway, Hudson Bell. First of all, I want to thank you for everything you have been doing and taking the time to listen to my concern. And I want to thank you for allowing our students the choice of attending school in person. We have been kindly and cooperatively abiding by the Ottawa County Health Department's regulations for in-person school instruction this far. However, over the past 12 months, the nationwide data, science, and local stats through the schools have proven that children wearing masks at school are not effective. And the data and science have proven over and over that children are not spreaders of COVID-19. We would like the health department to strongly consider allowing parents for their children and teachers to choose if they would like to wear a mask while attending in-person learning at school. Our children are suffering greatly from a virus that is a very low risk to them and a virus that has a 97 to 99.75% rate of recovery. We now have, now have a vaccination that has been distributed and available to teachers therefore keeping those who are at a higher risk safe. Now I want you to imagine yourself as an elementary student, six years old, 10 years old. You cannot see a smile on your teacher's face. You cannot see your classmates smile. You cannot hug a teacher when you feel sad. You cannot high five your teacher when you're excited or being encouraged. You cannot work together in a small group. You cannot have your mom or dad come into the classroom for a school party. You may have a headache every day. You may experience rashes on your face. You may feel sad, but you don't know why. This is how our children feel every day. And it needs to stop because there is no data to show our children are at risk and that they are super spreaders of the virus. Ottawa County statistics have shown zero deaths for children up to age 19. 
What is your goal and plan for when our children can be freed from wearing masks at school? Thank you. Thank you so much. We have one more commenter on Zoom. Um, so Lene, uh, please state your name, address, and you have three minutes. Oh, good afternoon, commissioners. Lene Monera, 6722 Pierce Street, Allendale. I was not planning to comment, but I just, I listened with interest to Lisa's comments. So I wanna make a few comments in regards to her comments. First of all, I heard Lisa say that the CDC has now defined exposure as three feet rather than six feet. I heard Lisa indicate that the Ottawa County Health Department contacted the state about that in order to get some guidance. And the state said, well, we're still gonna consider exposure as six feet. So Ottawa County is gonna stick with the state and keep it as at six feet rather than the three feet that the CDC has gone down to. I also heard Lisa indicate that the health department is listening and that it cares. Yet I also heard pleas two weeks ago on this meeting regarding our children's mental health as a result of the forced quarantines, the forced isolation, the forced um, removal from school for 10 to 14 days. So now the Ottawa County Health Department and the state has the opportunity to reduce the exposure from six feet to three feet, but they are not taking that opportunity. So respectfully, is our Ottawa County Health Department listening? Also, in the context of a high school wrestler from Coopersville who was disqualified last week from state wrestling tournaments, I quote from a newspaper article, Marsha Mansari, of the local health department, that is the Ottawa County Health Department, acknowledged that federal guide, guidance calls for a seven day quarantine, but the Michigan Health Department, she said, is sticking with 10 days, end of quote. Respectfully, commissioners, there is continued discretion given to the Ottawa County Health Department through the latest order, again, dated March 19 of this year. Ottawa County Health Department, is authorized but is not required to carry out and enforce the terms of the order. So my plea is that the health department truly listen, listen to the residents of Ottawa County and use the discretion to act in the best interests of our children. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Anyone else? That is all on Zoom. Okay, thank you. All right, next thing on the agenda is uh, approval of agenda. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. For it. Motion for it. Comments or questions? Rachel, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Garcia. Yes. Mr. Fenske. Yes. Mr. Zylstra. Yes. Mr. Dannenberg. Yes. Mr. Terpstra. I vote yes. Mr. Meppelink. Sorry, I'm having problems with my mute, my space bar. Uh, yes, I vote yes. Thank you. Mr. Holtfloor? I vote yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. Kyers? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Bergman? I vote yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Um, uh, guys, please say I vote yes or something like that. More than just one word. Otherwise, I can't hear it on Zoom, okay? Thank you. All right, actions and reports. Consent resolutions, Mr. Fenske. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to make uh, the motion to approve uh, the first consent uh, resolution coming from the clerk registrar's office, as well as uh, two other consent resolutions coming from administration, number one and number two. Support. Moved and supported. Comments or questions? Yeah, Mr. Chair. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to remove uh, from administration item number one, please. All right, is there a second for that? Oh, we don't need a second for that. So we're, we're, we're removing item one under administration. Uh, we need a second, Mr. Chair. Oh, we need a second. Okay, all right. Is there a second? I think we've had this discussion before, Mr. Chair. I, I don't believe we need a second on it, removal of consent agenda. 
Mr. Van Essen, do we need a second? I don't think we do, right? Removing something from the consent agenda? Well, and our new rules, uh, as proposed, we would we would need a second. Uh, I think right now we're operating under the old rules that don't contain don't. that provision, and therefore we don't. Okay. All right. That's what I thought. Okay. So we're removing that, and we're going to put it as um, under um, action items. We'll make it one um, A. And 1B will be Michigan State University Extension. Okay, so we're voting on consent resolutions one under county clerk register and under administration uh, number two. Further comments or questions? Rachel, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Dannenberg. Yes. Mr. Bauman. I vote yes. Mr. Fenske. I vote yes. Mr. Meppelink. I vote yes. Mr. Terpstra. I vote yes. Mr. Garcia. Yes. Mr. DeYoung. I vote yes. Mr. Holtlor. I vote yes. Mr. Zyra. Mr. Zyra. Vote, voting yes. Mr. Kyers. I vote yes. Mr. Bergman. I vote yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay. Under um, public hearings, we have none. Action items. Um, Declaration of local, state, and emergency resolution. Um, let's see. Mr. Fenske, will you make that motion, please? Absolutely. Support. Uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> so <we're not. laughs> Jim's got to get to the beach. Yeah. I got it. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like me to read the full yeah. motion? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, the suggested motion is to approve and authorize the board chairperson and clerk register to sign the resolution to extend a state of emergency within Ottawa County due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Support. Okay. Been moved and supported. Comments or questions? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I will be voting yes on this, but I just want to have a discussion quickly about what the... Thank boards uh, about virtual meetings and can we just have a clarification where we are uh, in the state of Michigan in virtual meetings? Yes, uh, my understanding is that the authorization to do any reason virtual meetings is uh, likely going to expire at the end of March. And, uh, and my understanding is that's because of the infighting between the legislature and the governor uh, and that in order for a county or a local unit of government to allow for hybrid or virtual meetings after that time, uh, they would have to be under a county or a local emergency order. Uh, a local government can be under the county order. So in our case, uh, the city managers of Holland, Ferrysburg, Grand Haven, the township supervisor of Spring Lake Township, I'm sorry, the township manager of Spring Lake Township have all called uh, Bob Sullivan from Scotland Fant, who represents a bunch of the communities uh, as their city attorney, township attorney, uh, and basically expressed that it would be uh, very convenient for them if the county would renew ours, because then we wouldn't have to have 24 governments in the county, each do their own. I'm told that it's a little more cumbersome process for a local government to, to do the emergency order than it is for the county government to do it. So that I believe is the up-to-date status. So on, on, the, on that, Mr. Administrator, there's, any, there's no sense that the state will take any more action on this item. I, you know, I don't think before the end of March, and okay. uh, there just seems to be <coughs> legislature maybe to deal with other issues as part of this legislation and unwillingness maybe on the administration to deal with those. And so I, I just don't see this being resolved. So we could easily have a situation where we have checkerboard throughout the count, throughout the state where some counties, yes, some counties, no. And if you're a township sitting on the county line with another township, you may not be able to, but the neighboring township may be able to. Exactly. Okay. And I I'll add one thing, the Michigan association of counties, uh, director, Steve Curry in a meeting with the county administrators recommended that if counties don't have one, they should do one. 
Okay. I do know Midland County did one last week and, and there's there's others as well. So great. They, they were doing special resolutions, right? Al? You know, uh, I'm not sure, Phil. Then they talk about that, Matt, when when uh, uh, Dana discussed legislative. Yeah, they did, but I'm not sure that they got total support for going. No, down. but I mean, there was there was a there was a bunch of counties that have done it already. So yeah, yeah. Um, I would I would check with Mac and see what the resolutions or what they're doing, surpassing the ordinance that that we can have. Sure. You know, so and we can go from there. Anyone else? I received a um, email from the mayor of uh, Grand Haven just yesterday asking us to please pass this today because um, they uh, um, want to continue to, they, they don't have the space to be able to have an open meeting and, and be able to space people within their council chambers. So um, they asked, would we please make sure that this gets passed? So with that, um, Rachel, would you call the roll, please? Yes, Mr. Oh, oh. Back on. Hang on. Uh -oh. Oh. 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 Sorry to ruin the party. the first one. Good afternoon, Mr. Uh, Chair and members of uh, the board. Uh, in regards to the uh, emergency order, um, first and foremost, I'm here to uh, support it. Uh, first, I want to thank you uh, for the support of the men and women of the Ottawa County Sheriff's Office during this pandemic. Uh, as law enforcement, we're normally able to sense danger or able to see it. Uh, COVID, it's the unseen and unsensible danger that our staff faces each day uh, as we provide uh, services throughout the county. Uh, as we know, things are improving, uh, such as our PPE supply, uh, the vaccine now available to law enforcement. Um, and again, uh, we face this each day. Uh, many changes uh, can occur also in the law enforcement realm. As sheriff, my priority is uh, to be able to provide professional and quality law enforcement services to the victims of crime and services to the citizens and the visitors of Ottawa County. I'm also responsible for the safety and the well being of the staff and the safety and security of the citizens that are inside the Ottawa County Jail facility. So far at the jail facility, we have done extremely well with our quarantine processes uh, and other processes in keeping COVID out of our jail. As you can imagine, if we get a COVID outbreak in the jail with approximately, uh, I think our count today was right about 230 inmates, um, that could be an issue for us. Uh, with the emergency order, I know uh, we're battling a lot of perception issues uh, from the community. Uh, but for the sheriff's office, uh, the emergency order will provide a tool for securing resources, movement on decisions uh, that have to be made quickly and assist uh, the management of the sheriff's office with decisions regarding our day-to-day -day operations. It allows us to be flexible in the needs of our road patrol and jail operations. Uh, the EO will also benefit many of our local jurisdictions, just as you heard, in many of those jurisdictions, the sheriff's office holds law enforcement contract services with. Uh, again, the EO gives us allowances, not restrictions at the county level. Uh, it's not in place uh, restrictions upon our community uh, or our businesses. So again, uh, there is a benefit for the sheriff's office to have this in place. Uh, I know that many other sheriffs across the state uh, also have their emergency orders in place from their counties. So again, I would uh, fully support uh, seeing the emergency order extended and would ask for your support also. Thank you. Thanks, Sheriff. Rachel? Yes. Mr. Kyers? I vote yes. Mr. Holtvlor? I vote yes. Mr. Meppelink? I vote yes. Mr. Ter Mr. Terpstra? I vote yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Zylstra? Voting yes. Mr. Fenske? I vote yes. Mr. Dannenberg? I vote yes. Mr. DeYoung? I vote yes. Mr. Bauman? I vote yes. Mr. Bergman? I vote yes. Motion passes. Thank you. You're welcome. Kyle, would you make the next motion, please? From administration, one. Yep, that is, uh, I'd like to make a motion, motion to receive information. The Michigan State University Extension 2020 Annual Report. Support. Supported comments or questions? Rachel, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Fenske? Oh, yes. Mr. Zylstra? Voting yes. 
Mr. Kyers? I vote yes. Mr. Garcia? I vote yes. Mr. Holt Bloor? I vote yes. Mr. Bauman? I vote yes. Mr. DeYoung? I vote yes. Mr. Mepelink? I vote yes. Mr. Annenberg? I vote yes. Mr. Terpstra? I vote yes. Mr. Bergman? I vote yes. Motion passes. Thank you. From planning and policy, Mr. DeYoung, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Regarding the Agricultural Economic Development Plan, I move to approve and authorize the board chairperson and clerk register to sign a resolution of support for the Ottawa County focus on agricultural plan. Support. I moved and supported. Comments or questions? Rachel, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Zylstra? Voting yes. Mr. Fenske? Vote yes. Mr. Bauman? I vote yes. Mr. Kyers? I vote yes. Mr. Garcia? Vote yes. Link? I vote yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Vote yes. Mr. DeYoung? I vote yes. Mr. Holtvloer? I vote yes. Mr. Terpstra? I vote yes. Mr. Bergman? I vote yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Resolution of support for the creation of the groundwater board. I move to approve and authorize the board chairperson and clerk register to sign a resolution of support for the creation of an Ottawa County groundwater board. Support. Support. Moved and supported. Comments or questions? Yeah, I got one comment. I uh, was approached by some uh, farmers in agriculture that they, uh, I know we talked about it before. I think the Farm Bureau is gonna be on here. Eventually we talked about that. Was that this group, Paul, or not? Paul, come on up. With yeah, ground, have... with groundwater Task Force, the group we have here, I was approached by agriculture farmers that they, were, they would like to have a seat on the board. And I said, we talked about adding or putting more on there. I said, I think that would be a possibility. So it would be it would be some of the higher end uh, crop, uh, grow crop farmers or guns that extract a lot of water out of the groundwater. They yes. would like to sit on this board. Okay. Would that be- we can, okay. we can take that up at one of the first meetings of the board and maybe make a recommendation back here to add. Okay, you know, and, I, and I'll give you some names that would, would appreciate that where okay. that draw a lot of water from, from the ground. So. Good, perfect. Thanks, right. Phil. You bet. Anyone else? Who would you call the roll, please? Yes, Mr. Bauman. I vote yes. Mr. Garcia. I vote yes. Mr. Link. I vote yes. Mr. Holt Bloor. I vote yes. Mr. DeYoung. I vote yes. Mr. Zylstra. Vote yes. Mr. Terpstra. I vote yes. Mr. Kyers. I vote yes. Mr. Dannenberg. I vote yes. Mr. Fenske. I vote yes. Mr. Bergman. I vote yes. Motion passes. Regarding the Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund grant application for Kirk Park, I move to approve the rec recommendation of the application to the Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund program for funding assistance of $474,000 to renovate facilities at Kirk Park. Support. Been moved and supported. Comments or questions? Rachel, would you call the roll, please? Yes, Mr. Terpstra. I vote yes. Mr. Holt Bloor. I vote yes. Mr. Zylstra. I vote yes. Mr. Kyers. I vote yes. Mr. DeYoung. I vote yes. Mr. Mepelink. I vote yes. Mr. Bauman. I vote yes. Mr. Fenske. I vote yes. Mr. Dannenberg. I vote yes. Mr. Garcia. I vote yes. Mr. Bergman. I vote yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Regarding the Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund grant application for Stearns Bayou, I move to approve the rec recommendation of the application to the Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund program for funding assistance of $300,000 to construct the Stearns Buyer connector segment of the Grand River Greenway Itama Explorers Trail. Support. Moved and supported. Comments or questions? Okay. Rachel, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Kyers. I vote yes. Mr. Holt Bloor. I vote yes. Mr. Garcia. I vote yes. Mr. Berg. I vote yes. Mr. DeYoung? I vote yes. Mr. Zylstra? Uh, I vote yes. Mr. Terpstra? I vote yes. Mr. Methelin? I vote yes. Mr. Bauman? I vote yes. Mr. Fenske? I vote yes. Mr. Bergman? I vote yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Regarding the approval of the amended 2021 board rules, I move to approve the rules committee 
Recommendation amendments to the 2021 board rules. Support. I move to support it. Comments or questions? Mr. Chair? Yes. Yeah, I just want to express my disappointment here that we're not being permitted uh, to make any changes to the board rules or allowed any amendments. Uh, the board rules are our rules, and as such, I believe they should be a product of discussion amongst ourselves, not something presented to us on a yes or no vote. Anyone else? Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I wanted to just, uh, you know, I wanted to clarify a point that uh, the, the corporate council made when uh, when Commissioner Salster asked to remove something from the consent items. You know, as I'm reading them right now, it looks like it doesn't need a, a second a, a second on it, even with the uh, uh, the proposed changes. I guess I just needed some clarification on that one. Mm -hmm. and that would be under rules. Uh, We'll put 2.3. Commissioner Garcia, you're correct in the context uh, that that was raised earlier, which was to pull the emergency resolution off. That's not a contract. What the new rules would require is that if you're going to pull a contract off of the consent resolution, then you need a second and you need right. part of the commission to do that. A non-contractual item is still subject to today's rule, which would allow one commissioner to pull that item off for a separate vote. Okay, and that's how I understood it. Contract. Mr. Chair? Yes. Can I get clarification from council? What exactly is act in this uh, instance? Well, clearly uh, the uh, emergency declaration is not a contract. So in this context, even if this uh, package of rules is adopted, next meeting or the next time this comes up, you could again pull that item off as you did today, Commissioner Zylstra, with only your request that it be separately discussed and voted. Uh, accounts payable um, and the ratification contractual a list requires two things. One, you alert the administration and the board chair at least 24 hours in advance that you or any other commissioner intend to try to pull that off the consent decree so that we can be uh, uh, aware at, of that re potential request and you know address the merits of that particular contract and then secondly, in order to actually pull it off, you would need a second, you would need to have the commission's vote to separately vote on that issue. And that's for accounts payable and for contracts from corporate council, correct? That is not referred to budget transfers? That, correct, that's not for budget transfers, that's for any uh, contract that, that is up for approval and ratification in the consent agenda mm -hmm. and accounts payables, which are also a form of- Okay, I just wanna clarify what yeah. exactly is, is counting as contracts. So contracts coming from you and accounts payable. Contracts that are in the ratification process. Correct. Correct. I do weigh in on those, so does administration and finance. But yes, generally right. speaking. Thank you. Correct. Frank, did that answer your question also? Yes, yes. And that's I uh, right, and that's how I understood it. I thought I heard Doug say though that in the future that it would need a second, and uh, I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, I was confused earlier. Okay. 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 But yeah, will somebody mark that down, please? <laughs> <laughs> I'll knock that off my bill. Okay. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? All right. Would you call the roll, Rachel? Mr. Garcia. Yes. Mr. Fenske. I vote yes. Mr. Zylstra. Vote no. Mr. Dannenberg. I vote yes. Mr. Terpstra. I vote no. Mr. Meppelink. I vote yes. Mr. Holtvloer. I vote yes. Mr. Bauman. I vote yes. Mr. Kyers. I vote yes. Mr. DeYoung. I vote yes. Mr. Bergman. I vote yes. Motion passes. Thank you.
Mr. Bauman from Finance Administration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Regarding the fiscal year 2021 budget adjustments, I make a motion to approve the fiscal year 2021 budget, budget adjustments per the attached schedule. Supported. Been moved and supported. Comments or questions? Rachel, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Dannenberg? I vote yes. Mr. Bauman? I vote yes. Mr. Fenske? I vote yes. Mr. Meppelink? I vote yes. Mr. Terpstra? I vote yes. Mr. Garcia? I vote yes. Mr. DeYoung? I vote yes. Mr. Holtfloor? I vote yes. Mr. Zylstra? I voting yes. Mr. Kyers? I vote yes. Mr. Bergman? I vote yes. <clears throat> Motion passes. Regarding the jail management system, the jail tracker, I make a motion to approve and authorize the board chairperson and clerk register to sign the proposed five-year contract with core technology for the jail tracker jail management system funded under capital improvement plan for $469,129. Support. Support. Supported comments or questions? Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Yeah, is uh, the sheriff still there or no? Uh, the under sheriff is here. Yeah. And she's going to give us the scoop. Oh, okay, I'll wait for your scoop and then maybe I'll have a question for you. Perfect. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Bergman and Vice Chair Fenske and the county board. Um, this is a project we've been working on for over a year and it's replacing um, an old system. And we've been working on this with the with fiscal services, Karen's team. Uh, they've been great because it's been a, a, a large um, undertaking because it's our incomplete system, which is also involving the courts, prosecutor's office, probation. And when we originally set out to do this, we did a collaborative team with everybody involved from um, all the disciplines. And we really set out for one system. Uh, as we worked through the through the process, uh, we realized that um, that was not going to work, and we were able to uh, through the RFP process uh, look at Core Tracker, which is or um, our JMS, which is our jail management system, which we jail tracker through Core Technologies, and Core Technologies uh, focuses on integrations, which is going to be very important for us in the future as the courts, prosecutor's office, and probation choose uh, their software package, uh, Core Technologies focuses on those integrations. So we believe since we've been working with Core uh, for almost 20 years and other law enforcement applications that as we move forward with the other uh, applications, this is gonna be a great system to work off of. Uh, they have um, committed to about six months for implementation. Um, and once that's done, we could be up to a year or more for the rest of um, the products to be implemented and they're willing to come back and, and work with us again uh, with that integration process. Uh, so we're asking uh, the board to approve this so we can move forward. The other nice thing too, um, we did do some ad hoc committees uh, with our first uh, line users and they worked through the process, uh, which was different than we've done before, which really gave us a good idea of the people that are actually using the product to have a good understanding of our processes in, the, in our facility, which are completely different um, in different areas of the county and uh, other jails. So uh, they were all very impressed with the product and know that it'll work well. Uh, the other uh, facet of this is fiscal services will also have a piece of this because of some of the um, trust, trust trust accounts that work with our inmates as well, inmate citizens as well. Um, All right, Doug, you have some questions? Yeah, actually, uh, Val, thanks for uh, thanks for the uh, the uh, kind of information on that. Uh, one thing I just kind of as I pop around various counties, some of them have much more uh, robust public facing than other uh, counties. How do you kind of conceive of that? What do you mean public facing? Well, I mean, like there are some counties when you go in and basically you can see a lot of information on our on our residents and other counties that just don't permit, you know, the public to go on there. And we've had an issue about a year ago where folks just kind of going onto our website um, and maybe in inappropriate ways. Talking about the inmate lookup? Yeah, this, exactly. This would, be, this would be separate from that. Okay. Uh, the inmate lookup, we have um, restricted some of that access. We used to put all the information on there. Now you have to actually put a person's name, 
their uh, when they would have been in our facility to even find out if they're in there. So before it was a daily thing. Uh, we still work with um, our website to to deal with uh, some scrubbing of these companies that you're talking about that will sure. put information out there, but it's a lot more difficult now. So my understanding of jail tracker is that it will include inmate lookup or am I, do I have that wrong? That's under our MI Ottawa website. Okay. Okay. I just seeing other counties maybe incorporating jail tracker into their inmate lookup. Yeah. Maybe with, with something we could look at down the line. Okay. But, no, I mean, not something that I'm interested in doing, just kind of seeing what, you know, what your thoughts are on that. Yep. Our biggest thing is we want to protect the information as much as we can. Right. Our right. And in some counties, it doesn't seem as that that's their priority. So, yeah. So I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Have you checked with any other counties? I mean, are there other counties in Michigan that have this jail character system? Yes. Yeah. We, yeah, we work with fiscal services and they did uh, the background on that and, and through the whole process. Uh, we have listservs where uh, we can reach out to other undersheriffs and other uh, jail administrators to find out what systems they're using. And that's kind of how we started the process. Okay. Uh, and again, we know core uh, technologies. We've been working with them for over 20 years too. Oh, okay. Whereas there are other software systems out there that would have liked to have you use. Oh, yes. Yeah, we had, we went through, I believe it ended up being, I don't even remember. There's so many days of um, the RFP process, but we, we watched a lot of different systems we brought in our first line um, individuals to be using the systems and they were able to sit through those as well. Okay. So we saw several. Anyone else? Thank you, Bill. You're welcome. Not Rachel, would you Thank call you. the roll please? Thanks, Bill. Mr. Myers. I vote yes. Mr. Holtlor. I vote yes. Mr. Meppeling. I vote yes. Mr. Terpstra. I vote yes. Mr. Garcia. I vote yes. Mr. Zylstra? Uh, vote yes. Mr. Fenske? I vote yes. Mr. Dannenberg? I vote yes. Mr. DeYoung? I vote yes. Mr. Bauman? I vote yes. Mr. Bergman? I vote yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Regarding the resolution to authorize qualifying statements for bonding purposes, I make a motion to approve and authorize the board chairperson and clerk register to sign the resolution to authorize certification of a qualifying statement for bonding purposes. Second. <clears throat> supported comments or questions Rachel would you call the roll please Mr. Fenske I vote yes Mr. Zylstra vote yes Mr. Kyers I vote yes Mr. Garcia vote yes Mr. Holtvloer I vote yes Mr. Bauman I vote yes Mr. DeYoung I vote yes Mr. Meppelink I vote yes Mr. Dannenberg I vote yes Mr. Terpstra I vote yes Mr. Bergman I vote yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Regarding the Ottawa County Water Supply Refunding Bond Series 2021, to make a motion to approve and authorize the chair per chairperson and clerk register to sign the resolution to authorize the issuance of not to exceed 3.2 million Ottawa County Water Supply Refunding Bond Series 2021. That's for the Northwest Ottawa Water System. Second. Comments or questions? Rachel, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Zylstra. I uh, vote yes. Mr. Benzke. I vote yes. Mr. Bauman. I vote yes. Mr. Kyers. I vote yes. Mr. Garcia. I vote yes. Link. I vote yes. Mr. Dannenberg. I vote yes. Mr. DeYoung. I vote yes. Mr. Holtvloer. I vote yes. Mr. Terpstra. I vote yes. Mr. Bergman. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Regarding the fiscal services CMH personnel request, I make a motion to approve the request from fiscal services CMH to add one full-time equivalent claims billing analyst, uh, U2, at a cost of $73,341.69 and increase one accountant to a U4 to a budget audit analyst, U5 at a cost of $5,974.72 for a total cost of $79,316.41. Supported. Removed and supported. Comments or questions? Call the roll, please. Yes, I vote yes. Mr. Garcia. I vote yes. Mr. Meppelink. I vote yes. Mr. Holt Blur, sorry. I vote yes. Mr. DeYoung. I vote yes. Mr. Zylstra. 
Oh, yes. Mr. Terpstra. Oh, yes. Mr. Kyers. I vote yes. Mr. Dannenberg. I vote yes. Mr. Fenske. I vote yes. Mr. Bergman. I vote yes. Motion passes. Regarding the community mental health personnel request, I make a motion to approve the request from community mental health to make the following position additions at a total cost of $352,614 to add 4.8475 FTE commissioned base mental health clinicians at a cost of 104,000 and to add four one full-time equivalent mental health aid workers at a cost of $248,614. Supported. Moved and supported. Comments or questions? Follow the roll, please. Mr. Terpstra. I vote yes. Mr. Holtfloor. I vote yes. Mr. Zylstra. I uh, vote yes. Mr. Kyers. I vote yes. Mr. DeYoung. I vote yes. Mr. Mepelink. I vote yes. Mr. Bauman. I vote yes. Mr. Fenske. I vote yes. Mr. Dannenberg. Yes, vote. Mr. Garcia. I move yes. I vote yes. I'm sorry. Mr. Bergman. I vote yes. Motion passes. Okay. Under appointments, Mr. Garcia, you're up. Now I'm with, yes, now I'm going to move. Uh, yes, I'd like to uh, nominate the uh, Robert Brown to fill uh, one position as family member for the vacancy on the Community Mental Health Board beginning April 1st, 2021 and ending March 31st, 2024. Support. And moved and supported. Comments or questions? Follow the roll, please. Mr. Kyers. Robert Brown. Mr. Holtfloor. Robert Brown. Mr. Garcia. Brown. Mr. Dannenberg. Robert Brown. Mr. DeYoung. Robert Brown. Mr. Zylstra. Robert Brown. Mr. Terpstra. Robert Brown. Mr. Meppelink. Robert Brown. Mr. Bauman. Robert Brown. Mr. Fenske. Robert Brown. Mr. Bergman. Robert Brown. Um, Robert Brown passes. Our... Thanks. Also, yeah, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to place into nomination the name of LaVon Vanderzwag to fill one general public vacancy on the Community Mental Health Board beginning April 1st. 2021 in March 31st, 2024. Okay, Support. it's, it's supported. Support again. Uh, <laughs> questions. Rachel, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Garcia. Uh, yes. Mr. Fancy. Okay. Ronnie Vanderswag. Mr. Zylstra. Levon Vanderswag. Mr. Dannenberg. Bonnie Vanderswag. Mr. Terpstra. Vanderswag. Mr. Meppelink. Yvonne Vanderswag. Vanderswag. Mr. Bauman. Vanderswag. Mr. Kyers. Vanderswag. Mr. DeYoung. Vanderswag. Mr. Bergman. Vanderswag. Motion passes. Okay, under discussion items. Aaron, you've been patiently waiting. You can take those sunglasses off and let us see your smiling face with all that greenery behind you. Yes. <laughs> and give us your report. Well, first of all, thank you so much. Um, and I think I, I believe I have permission to share. So I'll just go ahead and do that right now. Can you all hear me and see this, the report on the screen okay? Yes. Wonderful, okay. Well, yes, thank you. We're gonna be presenting our 2020 annual report and I know it's beautiful out today. So we'll, we'll make sure it's brief. Um, we are excited to just talk about a little bit uh, what the challenges that we, had in 2020. Obviously, we had some unique programming challenges in the pandemic, but what we want to focus on for the day is just how we adapted in the pandemic, and I just want to highlight a few of those programs. So first of all, um, just within a week of that stay home, stay safe order that was implemented, wow, uh, almost a year ago or just about a year ago, we had created a remote learning and resources page essentially to make it so anyone in Michigan could access any of our programs. So we went almost completely virtual last spring. And what that meant for Ottawa County residents is that all of a sudden, all of our programs opened up to, to them no matter where they lived. And we found that Ottawa residents took over 400 MSU extension programs in 2020. So it has certainly given us something to think about and we know that we're gonna be returning to some level of normalcy and, and hopefully very, very soon. Um, but we also wanna explore hybrid models in the future, 
future to make sure that we're sort of hitting all of our audiences in Ottawa County. Uh, and don't worry, we will not be talking about all 400 programs today, but I do want to highlight a couple. And I have uh, invited our 4-H program coordinator on today to talk about her experience uh, launching a 4-H virtual fair and the first uh, virtual auction in the state. So Melissa, are you there and unable able to unmute yourself? There you are. Yeah, I am. Can you guys hear and see me all right? Sure can. Okay. Perfect. So as Aaron said, I just wanted to highlight a few things that we did um, within 4-H since it's such a big program in Ottawa County. So we put together the um, Ottawa County Virtual Showcase, 4-H Fair and Showcase in partnership with the Berlin Fair um, to provide an opportunity for youth to be able to showcase their 4-H projects this past summer because they all found pretty quickly opportunities to be able to highlight their 4-H projects um, were somewhat disappearing. So we put together the showcase. We had over 225 entries involved with that. A um, couple of highlights is that in Ottawa County, this was a statewide program that was set up through MSU Extension. And in Ottawa County, we were the very first county to run the um, virtual auction platform. So there were a lot of challenges with it, but we had a lot of fun. But that allowed some of these kids to be able to show and sell their market animals um, at prices that were near, you know, comparable market prices that they've gotten at the fairs in the past by participating that way. So the youth that sold their projects um, earned a combined $26,000. I We highlight this project because it was just, it was such an amazing experience. I worked hours, like tons of hours trying to put this together. We had to build it and put it together in about three to four weeks, just because the Berlin Fair is one of the first fairs that takes place in the summer throughout Michigan. So we didn't have a lot of time to put it together, but the dedication of a handful of volunteers that spent hours on the phone with me, building the platform, helping set up the classes, finding judges to do all that stuff was just amazing. I actually, a funny story is we launched the auction at midnight, which was a little bit of a learning opportunity, but, um, I was waiting up to make sure that it would launch live. And all of a sudden I was sitting at my computer and I get an email message from one of the volunteers. And she's like, where is it? And I said, I don't know, I can't find it. And as I called her, I got off the phone and I called the 24 hour support for the program we were using. And they come to find out they were launching it on central time, not Eastern time. So we both were chatting back and forth on email. And she said, well, we might as well stay up till 1 a.m. now, we're already up. So we were texting back and forth to make sure everything went out. But it was really cool. Um, just a great opportunity. As you can see, a mom had messaged us that said, you know, I'm a nurse who is working crazy hours and my kids have something to work forward to has been a blessing for them. So um, definitely emanates the true spirit of 4-H. So if you want to go to the next slide, Erin. A few other things that we've been doing, I just want to highlight the Hilltop Gang 4-H Club. This is one of our largest 4-H clubs in Ottawa County, and that's um, a picture of them at a 4-H club meeting pre-pandemic, hence the reason they're all together and um, not wearing masks and socially distancing. Obviously, it'll be a different picture when we do start meeting, but um, this club has adapted really well by doing monthly Zoom meetings. They've created digital challenges um, for 4-H members to participate in and have fun with. They've done contests that have allowed them to um, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm reading my slides, so I got on the wrong one here. Um, they've had 4-H members create showmanship videos and then send that to other members so that they can learn how to show that way. They've done study sheets, they've had trivial pursuit contests. They've even done fun games over like Zoom and things where every the 4-H leaders and the youth will send in a baby picture and then they'll all try and guess who it is. So that's one way that one group has managed to stay engaged um, and really kept the true spirit of what 4-H is. <laughs> And then the last thing I just wanted to highlight is in addition to, you know, clubs still meeting in person and then running the virtual fair this past summer, um, we have a lot of 4-H spin clubs that are taking place. And this has been a great opportunity to reach a non-traditional 4-H audience and pulling kids within the county and even from a statewide place to participate in programs that we have available. We, you know, there's been 4-H coding weekend, there's been 4-H in the kitchen, Minecraft spin clubs, scavenger hunts. They're getting ready to run a big skillathon um, this upcoming weekend. So it's been a great opportunity for us to expand programming and reach out. And we're excited to 
be able to continue our traditional things when it's safe to resume all those activities. But I will let Erin go back and cover the rest of our programs. Oops, got that. Thanks, Melissa. And, you know, we consistently get calls from parents still adding their children to 4-H. So it is a growing program. Um, we're really proud of our ability to adapt this past year and know that the commissioners have received a lot of questions about 4-H and especially as it related to FAIR last year. So we wanted to make sure you all knew uh, how we did pivot last year in the pandemic. So I'm now going to uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about how MSU Extension has stepped up for agriculture in the pandemic. We serve as a liaison to agriculture across the entire state, but that's especially true here in Ottawa County. And so we felt we were uniquely positioned to create this rapid response page for COVID-19 resources. So some of what you see listed on the screen, these are just a few of the examples of what we created. So guidance for greenhouses on how to safely resume um, business. This was early pandemic. We created safety protocol for both for farm labor in both Spanish and English. And actually most recently we've created um, guidance for how to register for the vaccine for that farm labor. Um, I know Lisa mentioned we're about to get an influx of, of migrant, uh, seasonal migrant labor and we are ready to receive that influx and educate them about the importance of getting vaccinated. We created a COVID hazard assessment mitigation plan tool. So we call it the CHAMPS tool. It's a big handful acronym there. Um, essentially, this is a tool that ag producers use now to assess their risk of COVID spread in their operations and then how to mitigate that sp spread. And that's going to be increasingly important as we see vaccination rates go up and migrant workers come in, we wanna make sure that um, ag producers know how they can mitigate spread um, among, while this pandemic is ongoing. And I have a couple more slides of just our top requested programs in the county. And this one took me by surprise this year, but it's really fun to share with you all. We hired a new food safety educator in 2020. And before he could really even get, you know, hit the ground running, we went into the stay home, stay safe order but we have served over 4,000 people across the state of Michigan with food safety and food preservation classes. So it gets you thinking about where everyone's mind was during this pandemic. And that was certainly true here in Ottawa County. And another funny story is if you would have been hard pressed to find canning jars last fall, they were sold out on every shelf in, in Southwest Michigan. And we think it's a due in, in small part because we are launching this educational programming. We also have a pretty strong partnership with the library system here, specifically with Laudit District Library. They, we learned that libraries wanted to keep offering classes to their clients, to the, to the people that um, come to the library. But when they were shut down, they needed to do that virtually and didn't have the capacity to do so. So that's one of the benefits is, of working with a team of educators is that we can take on that burden and that, or really privilege of creating these educational programs that libraries can promote on our behalf. Um, so I heard from you know, Lisa's team and, and people throughout the county about how, how we need to start paying attention to social and emotional health. And really, um, we continue to hear this, the need to work from home and keep our distance from others puts a strain on that mental health. So we're really proud to have offered classes in these categories, relax alternatives to anger, stress less with mindfulness, uh, teaching kids mindful eating. And this was the top requested class of 2020. Over 6,000 residents in Michigan took classes in these categories, about 200 from Ottawa County. But it's really giving us something to think about because we know that this is not over. We know the pandemic isn't over and we know the need for to pay attention to mental health is, is going to be on the rise. So I wanted to just make sure you as commissioners knew that this was a resource that we're kind of leaning into at Michigan State and um, make sure that your we would love for you to um, let your constituents know that this is available for them. And last but certainly not least, uh, because Ottawa County is both home to rivers and shoreline, I like to make sure you all know about our partnership with Michigan Sea Grant. Uh, we had three marquee programs this year. The first is paddle stewards to educate paddlers about how they're spreading invasive diseases or invasive species from bodies of water from one to another. And it's really important that we educate them so that they know what they can do as an individual to prevent that. We launched the Michigan Water School in 2020 to educate policymakers. We had 16 Ottawa County policymakers attend our water school to learn about 
policies associated with bodies of water. Uh, we launched the Angler Project in partnership with the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. And essentially what this is, is we are making sure that all the, the um, fish have been marked, sorry, steelhead have been marked. And Dr. Dan O'Keefe, who you all know pretty well, uh, he launched an educational program for anglers and steelheaders to know what they could expect. And so they can also contribute to the citizen science that we need to collect as Michigan State to keep this project going to keep healthy rivers and healthy lakes. And last, this was not an educational project, but certainly something that I think you all would like to know. Dr. O'Keefe sent surveys to all the charter boat captains on the shoreline counties, so Ottawa and, and down further south, and asked about for them to self-report their revenues from 2019 to 2020. We had about a 50% response rate and learned that they were self-reporting about $6 million in lost revenue. Uh, we worked with uh, the Great Lakes Fisheries and let them know, we were sort of educating them on the back end. We want you all to know that this is happening, that um, this seemed to be a little bit overlooked in 2020. They did not receive any funding in the first round of CARES Act. The CARES Act, I'm, I can't remember the date that was passed. However, on the second round that was passed late December, they received $15 million that was specifically appropriated for commercial agriculture processing and charter fisheries. So we were told and we were thanked by the Great Lakes Fishery Commission for the, the survey data that we provided to help them ask for that money and make it known how much of an issue it was that charter boats were, were experiencing that um, downfall in revenue. And so we're also going to step up and help charter boats captains access that funding when the process becomes available. So that was a whirlwind, but uh, uh, we just wanted to say thank you so much and thank you for allowing us to postpone by a couple of weeks our report today. And hopefully uh, we have some time to answer questions. Anyone questions? No one on Zoom questions? Okay. Aaron, uh, six million dollars lost in revenue for charter boats. That's a big number, and I remember seeing at Chinook Pier last summer that um, most of those boats were sitting in dock most of the summer. Um, and I, I wondered about how does that continue, and what happens to all the fish that were planted last year? Um, it's got to be it's got to be a lot bigger. Um, of uh, uh, fish, the, the amount of fish has to be greater this year than it was before because they're gonna plant more, is that correct? They're, they're gonna put some out, out, out again, steelhead? I believe they have to just based on their, the cyclical nature of that work. Um, Dan O'Keefe of course would be able to give a better answer but you know he was able to sort of just pivot where he was. He saw right away um, the, you know, the, the loss of revenue was one thing from 2019 to 2020. They also reported a 50% reduction in bookings for 2021. So we're also hoping, of course, that that goes up as we see, um, as we learn more about the, the pandemic and vaccination rates, et cetera. But yes, we expect the lakes to be fully stocked and we're gonna need to do some education about that. Oh, so it sounds like we need to educate the public that uh, fishing is back, right? Fishing, fishing is back. Yeah, yeah. Roger, I got a question. Do you, know if, do you know if MSU has has COVID money from the feds for stuff like that, or don't you know? For relief funds for like the charter boats, any idea? MSU does not receive that funding, but there is um, in the CARES Act funding, there was $15 million. So that's all our role at this point will be is to make sure once NOAA develops the process, we will learn the process, the step-by-step -step process we will host educational sessions for all, um, you know, we have relationships with the steelheader groups in your county and, and of course surrounding counties. So we will explain that step-by-step -step process because as you all know, just because the money exists doesn't mean people understand how to tap into that resource and know, even know it's there. So that's where we'll step in. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> Aaron and Melissa, thank you for your report today. Thank you so much. Enjoy your afternoon. All right, next report of the county administrator. Yeah, just a couple items for you today. So very much with uh, Aaron's report on the CARES Act, we're still waiting 
for direction from the U.S. Department of Treasury on uh, how to access and then how we'll be accountable for the nearly $57 million in Rescue Act dollars that apparently has been allocated to Ottawa County. Um, I should also say, I, I did hear today that one of the fiscal agencies of the state is prepared to report, uh, but again, they don't have any better information than we do, so it's, I don't have it yet and it's not complete, but hopefully we'll start honing in on what the rules of engagement are so we can start to work uh, with that, uh, obtaining and distributing uh, some of those funds. Uh, I just wanted to make clear because I think the sheriff's getting a lot of feedback about uh, Marlena's restaurant, everything going on. I wanted to make sure everybody understands that that's in Allegan County <laughs> and that that was the yeah. attorney general's office and the state police that handled that and the individuals in the Ingham County Jail because that's what happens when the state issues a warrant and serves it and takes care of that, they bring them to Ingham County. So I just wanted to make sure that people out there in our world understood that because we're getting uh, uh, some questions in that regard. Also, the other thing, and based on some of the public comment today, I just wanted to make sure folks also understood, I, what I was hearing was, gee, the health department has discretion, they have choice, because the CDC has a different standard than DHHS. They don't get to choose between those two. So DHHS, by state law, by the fact that they are in charge of the public health code, and that Lisa and the public health department have to listen to their directives and follow their directives, they don't get to choose between the CDC and, and public health or, or DHHS. Most of the time, I think they're aligned, but sometimes CDC will make a change and DHHS doesn't catch up. Or, and I know that there was a, a recent case where we actually asked the state if they would allow us to go with the CDC standard and they said no. Um, uh, let's see, I think. Other than that, you know, uh, Karen's got the budget process in full swing and, uh, you know, we're keeping up with our strategic plan work and, uh, and things, are, things are going well. I think one of the next big things we'll be looking for is, uh, you know, when are the MIOSHA rules uh, relaxed so we get more people back to work? Um, and so we're watching that closely. That's all for today. Okay. Next thing is general information, comments, or meetings attended. Anyone? Mr. Chair, yes. I, had, I had my first NACO board meeting Friday. Um, so they actually voted me into the board, believe it or not. But so that was interesting. <laughs> but they did talk about the CARES Act quite a bit. And they, and they said that one of the big things Matt Chase, administrator from NACO said, you know, they're watching really close, but right now they have nothing either. And as soon as they get something, they'll go right down to us. But he did say, you know, be very cautious of what you spend this on. <laughs> you know, just make sure it's black and white because he says that's what they're looking for. So okay. that was his advice to the counties. Congratulations, Ray. It was interesting. Yeah. 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 It lasted a little too long to suit me, but that was okay. <laughs> background check and everything, Phil? They did a background check, Al. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, they did, thanks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they called Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Mr. Chair? Go ahead. Hey, uh, Phil, actually a question on that. When NACO says black and white, what do they mean by black and white? He says, when, whatever the programs they have written down, he said, don't try to cross the line and make it gray. He says, because we believe if you do that, that's one of the reasons they'll, re they'll reject your money and, and not give you the money. So. What does that mean by gray? I mean, I mean, what are the... Uh, they'll, what have is, all, they'll have all the stipulations. Green and what's red here, I guess. He, the way they talk to have all, everything we can spend it on, what we can do with it right down to the letter. So that's why we got to go by what what they send us, and not what we think they should we should spend it on. Okay, they'll, they'll tell us what to spend. But it Treasury on. doesn't have any guidance yet that we could actually go by a green light or red light yet. Nope, they do not. So when Treasury does come out, NACO is saying stay in the green zone. Exactly. But NACO doesn't have any idea from Treasury yet what that might be. Nope. Okay. Nope. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks, Phil. Anyone else? Mr. Chairman, on Zoom, Randy. Um, Al, I just, this is just a question, not, don't need an answer today, but I'm just curious. My question would be is if everybody on the board, Al, if we all are vaccinated at what time would, at what point would we still be required to wear masks at a meeting based on some of the new things? That would be one of the questions I, I, I had. Was that question for Al Dannenberg? Yes. I'll handle that, Randy. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'll find out. I will find. I will do my best to find that out, Randy. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else? Yes. Yes. Um, I had uh, community correction advisory committee meeting this morning, and we had uh, Circuit Judge Van Allsburg and Probate Judge uh, Fine, District Judge Bunce along with uh, uh, Mr. Fisher, and there was 15 of us. And what I wanna basically say is it was, it was very workable. Uh, we were in the, in the large room, we were spaced out. Um, everybody in that room wanted to be there in person rather than Zoom. And so it, it can work, it can work. And um, I'm kind of excited. I, I brought up to uh, my, uh, my CMH board yesterday where they wanted to deviate and not do a hybrid or Zoom, but actually in person. And everyone on that CMH board uh, wants to do it in part person. So I think we're starting to loosen up a little bit. We still got to be careful, but even, you know, like Ag Preservation Board, um, I'm planning in May to do that in person. And so um, I'm feeling good about it. And I just wanted to say something positive about today's meeting that worked out well. And that's it. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I should mention one more thing. We did. We did change our. Um, we voted on having the conference, the the NACO conference, um, since it was canceled in Texas. Since that's a big hub where they're doing vaccinations, we moved it to Maryland. So it'll be in July in Maryland in person. So mm -hmm. big, big conference hall there because most of the places that they had, some of the places in Washington D.C. are are literally bankrupt. They're filing and they're. Uh, Okay. I think there was one other thing. Oh, tomorrow we have at noon. I don't know if you noticed it on the schedule. Yep. We, have, we have Biden at noon and we have Pelosi at one o'clock. So, hmm. okay. we'll sleep all night. Anyone else? If not, we're on to public comment. Is there anyone in the public that would like to address? Is there anyone on Zoom? No. Nope. All right. I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Court. Who can support it? Comments or questions? All in favor say aye. 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 aye.